Master, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Now, in keeping with tradition, ladies and gentlemen, I just have a few housekeeping announcements for you. First of all, and most importantly, emergency exits. Now, I know that most of you here are very familiar with Butchers Hall, but for those guests who may not be, we have two emergency exits in this room. This one, which you've just passed through, and one halfway down the room there on my left. And in the unlikely event that we do incur an emergency, ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you to walk in a nice, sensible, orderly manner? Unless you see me running past you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, today, we have obviously a lecture and we have a panel session. And I just want to kindly ask you that if you want to pose a question, if questions are invited from the floor, please put up your hand, wait till a microphone is brought to you, and then kindly pose your question. Please keep it brief, ladies and gentlemen, as I must remind you that these proceedings are being recorded this evening probably be on television, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, also, ladies and gentlemen, um, once you finish with the microphone, kindly pass it straight back to our operative and they will look after it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, mobile telephones. Can I ask you to kindly ensure that they are switched off, ladies and gentlemen? Not only do they disturb other delegates, but they also interfere with the radio microphones. Thank you very much for that. And now, finally, it gives me great pleasure to invite the master of the Worshipful Company of Butchers to the lectern. Will you please give a warm welcome for Margaret Bonas. Fellow liverymen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Butchers Hall and to this, our very first city meat lecture. In a moment, I will hand over to Stuart Roberts, NFU Deputy President and Liverman of the Worshipful Company of Butchers. Stuart is chairing this evening's event um, and ha has just been explained by the Beadle. He will introduce our guest speaker who, to deliver his lecture. Following that, he will invite the three panellists to come onto the stage and they will be given some time to respond to the lecture. There will then be an opportunity for questions from the floor. Stuart, over to you, please, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Uh, and it is a genuine pleasure to, uh, to also welcome everyone to Butchers Hall. What a wonderful surrounding to have the lecture in. Um, I thought I ought to start with two apologies. Uh, the first one, um, particularly to you, Master, I must apologise for not wearing a jacket in Butchers Hall. I hope it is bloody obvious why I'm not wearing one. Uh, and that is basically because whenever I put it on at the moment, it falls straight off. So uh, it is here and it has got a poppy on it before I get picked on uh, from that point. The second one, I want to apologise to, uh, to our speakers. Normally at these events, when we have the discussion at the end, uh, we have very comfy armchairs, we have a fireside chat. Uh, we haven't got those for one reason only, and that's because I was at an event this afternoon where there was such a comfortable armchair. And having come down from COP this morning on the ever so romantic travel of the sleeper, I just realized that a six foot five bloke and a five foot six bed do not fit. And therefore the comfy chair this afternoon when I was speaking to a group of vets made me doze off. So apologies to our speakers. Um, I also have one final apology. It's easy to get these out of the way to start with and that's to Bob Bansback. Um, so Bob, as many of you will know, uh, has been quite instrumental in this evening. Bob gives phenomenally comprehensive instructions and briefing notes. Uh, indeed, the speech I have been given to give you guys is unbelievably comprehensive. I will still be here in half an hour's time talking it through. 
What Bob hasn't realized is that my dyslexia means that I talk faster than I read, so therefore I am completely ignoring what he has written down, because otherwise it'll be gobbledygook. So apologies, Bob. But let's move on. I am delighted to introduce tonight's main speaker to give our lecture. Uh, it is a celebrity. Indeed, I, when I was in COP, uh, day before yesterday in Glasgow, somebody came up to me and made me promise that I would let them have a selfie with you once you have finished speaking. So you are absolutely a celebrity. You are well known to the industry. Uh, and when people have heard what you've got to say, those of you that have not heard you before will understand why you are so important and what you've got to say is so important. It's very easy for people like me to try and defend the meat industry, but actually the reality is it's the evidence that sits behind what we say that is important, and that's what comes from yourself. So I am delighted to introduce Professor Frederick Leroy. He is Professor of Food Science and Biological Science at Vrie University in Brussels. He is acknowledged, as I say, as a real expert in this area, and we are delighted that you have joined us from Brussels today to give your talk on the rightful place of meat in the national diet. Frederick, over to you. Well... <clears throat> Thank you very much for the very kind words, and uh, th thank you for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and honor to be in this prestigious setting um, and to be able to talk about what I think is one of the most fascinating foods. Uh, and um, what you see on this slide here is <clears throat> it's, it's, it's essentially the result of countless years of co-evolution of animals, plants, soil, microbes, and humans. And it is the food that made us human to begin with. So for that reason alone, it deserves our respect. It is also the best possible option we have to create food from inedible materials and to valorize marginal lands, contributing to food security. And let's not forget, this is not just a commodity. This is not just a heap of protein. This is also, or at least it should be, a symbol of tradition and generosity and pride. And nonetheless, what we're facing today is some very influential people stating that we should stop production and consumption of this, of this food. That includes, for instance, Richard Branson stating that all meat, all meat will have to be replaced by 2050 by either lab-produced um, tissue-engineered versions or the plant-based versions. <clears throat> Bill Gates has stated that the West should shift entirely to synthetic beef in the next decades. And it doesn't stop there. This is taken to the highest transnational levels. <clears throat> Let me remind you of this. This happened in 2018. United Nations Environment Program gave the highest distinction within the environmental arena to two plant-based meat companies, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. And by doing so, they also published something on their website that I would like to show here on, on my right-hand side identifying meat as the world's most urgent problem. So we're not talking about fossil fuels, we're talking about meat as being the most urgent problem on the United Nations Environment, Environment Program website. <clears throat> so the question here is, why is UNEP, first of all, being unscientific? Because this is not a scientific statement. Why are they endorsing a fast food culture? Because in the end, the so-called imitations are usually burgers and uh, sausages, and, and, and they are presented as such. I mean, you can, you can see it in the tweets from, from UNEP. Main, so it's about mainstreaming meatless burgers, <clears throat> and now um, Beyond Meat has also, for instance, a planet, a planet partnership with PepsiCo. So they're, they're de facto 
promoting fast food culture, which is interesting. And as a third point, they are endorsing radical agendas because what both companies have said is that they want to eliminate animal agriculture. So make no mistake, this is not about offering an extra choice. This is not about coexisting with traditional agriculture. This is about displacement. This is a citation coming from the CEO of Impossible Foods, Pat Brown, where he states that they plan to take a double-digit portion of the beef market in the first years and then push that industry into a death spiral. So, and then after that, so they're not going to stop there. After that, the intention is to, to point to the pork and the, and the poultry industry, and they should be next. He also said that livestock is a prehistoric food production technology. That's an interesting one. And that they want to put this industry out of business, saying that it's, it's that simple. In their view, it's that simple. Well, I would like to argue that it's not that simple. Now, clearly, if we talk about animal agriculture, <coughs> this can be done in harmful ways, obviously. I mean, if we're talking about deforestation, if we're talking about excessive reliance on monocultures and, and fossil fuels, if it leads to overgrazing and to soil erosion, there are many problems that can be identified, and there's a lot of work ahead. There's, things need to be done. But it can also be a very beneficial production system where you start from natural resources, rain, sun, grass, and you use those resources to produce valuable foods. At the same time, contributing to soil health and to livelihoods and many other aspects of society. Of course, the challenge will be how do we measure that? When do we know if a practice is good or bad? So you will need metrics. A lot relies on metrics, and I will talk about metrics in this presentation. One of the classical metrics is the one of CO2 equivalence. <clears throat> and through CO2 equivalence, you can look at different production systems and compare them. And that makes sense. That's, that's useful information. But we need to be very careful when we um, use those metrics to design policies. Because metrics have their specific purpose. And it's uh, dangerous or reductionist to not place them in a larger uh, context. Let me just to give you the simple case of uh, CO2 equivalents, and I'm sure people in the room are aware of this, but I would just like to re reiterate it. There's a fundamental difference between CO2 coming from fossil fuels, which is basically ancient carbon that has been fossilized over millions of years and is put into the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. Now, you can contrast that with methane coming from, from livestock, which is belched out by the cow, um, is broken down to CO2, enters photosynthesis, and ends up in a biogenic cycle. So that methane differs from CO2 in its, in its dynamics, acting as a flow pollutant in contrast to being a stock pollutant. So that's one thing. Another thing is, of course, that we talk a lot about emissions, but we forget that there's also a sequestration taking place, and that this sequestration can at least partially offset those emissions. And all that should be taken into account if we're talking about greenhouse gases. And that's not an easy thing to do, and that, what, that is also the reason why some people like the simplistic approaches um, <clears throat> that you see presented all the time. And I want to give you an example that even when we overlook all these complexities and just look at, at, the, mere, at, at the numbers, still we have to put perspective. Um, we have to start from, from, a, from a comprehensive perspective. You often find these kind of statements in, in the press. Uh, and this one is even coming from, from Oxford University. A vegan diet is probably the biggest um, way you have to reduce your emissions. And your impact on planet Earth, it even goes further than the emissions. Or you have statements that state that going vegetarian will lead to half of your carbon footprint, and vegan, a vegan diet will reduce it with 73%, and so forth, and so forth. Now, those numbers are not completely false, but they are just framed in very misleading ways. Because you would have to understand or, or, or situate that within, you know, within your overall footprint. So let me give you the example here. This is the example of an average footprint of a Frenchman. So it's just it's data from, French, from France. I could give you other examples, but this is the data from France. So if, if in that perspective you would go vegan or vegetarian or flexitarian, the effect on your footprint would be somewhere between 1% and 6%, depending on how you look at it, to which degree you become you know, plant-based or uh, to which degree rebound effects will play. It's a complicated story, but it's essentially something between 1% and 6%. It's a couple of percentages. 
it's something, but it's certainly not what is being promised on the left side of, of this um, slide. And that same order of magnitude is also found when you start from another, from another basis. If you, start from a, if you do a modeling study, and this is a modeling study that people talk a lot about, is the one, you know, the study from White and Hall from 2017, where they have looked at the emissions within the United States, and basically if you would remove livestock, that would um, give you an effect of about 3%. So it's the same order of magnitude, even if you take another, uh, another perspective. But interestingly, and that will be the topic of, of most of my, my uh, talk afterwards, I will, I will take this discussion from the environmental story to the nutritional story. Because what they also say is if you do that, at the same time, you will create deficiencies in some of the essential nutrients. And that's uh, something extremely important if you look at environmental metrics. A metric usually looks like this. You have a numerator and you have a denominator. The denominator will um, quantify your... Um, your impact on water use or land use or CO2 emissions, and then that will be scaled per unit of food, right? That's how it's usually done. Um, the above comes with several complexities. If you talk about liters of water, you will have to differentiate between green water and blue water and, and so forth. Land, of course, you have marginal lands, you have land that enters food feed competition. So these are complicated matters. We talked about, we talked about CO2, but what is hardly addressed is what's at the bottom of this uh, fraction, and that's the, the unit of food, because this is scaled per unit of food. And you can do that per kilogram of food, and that makes sense sometimes when you want to compare the same food under, under different practices. But it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to compare a kilogram of beef with a kilogram of tomatoes, because they're nutritionally completely different. Um, you would sometimes see calories or protein, which go more in the nutritional direction, but it's still not good enough. Let me give you an example here. This is one of the many examples of uh, those, you know, those bar diagrams where you have the impact of certain foods. And systematically, you will see that beef comes out worse. It's the one at the bottom. It's the, the huge bar. Uh, this is coming from the World Resources Institute. And that is, of course, because this is expressed as uh, CO2 equivalence, and we, we've seen what CO2 equivalence, how, how complex that already is, but it's also expressed per million calories consumed. Now, if you follow that logic, you would end up by choosing the foods at the top of the graph, and that would be sugar, oils, and starchy staples. Now, that's not the nutrition you want for the planet, because we know that the, the major challenges, nutritionally speaking, that are ahead of us for, for mid-century have to do with protein, quality protein, just not just any protein, we need quality protein, and a whole range of micronutrients that are more bioavailable and better obtained, at least some of them, um, from animal source foods. We're talking about calcium and, and zinc and iron and B12. And those really matter. And it's not just restricted to the global south. It's not just a matter of developing countries. Even in the West, there is a serious challenge ahead um, with respect to some of those micronutrients. This is information coming from Australia where pediatricians and, and medical doctors are becoming concerned about the state of public health within the younger populations because uh, they, they now have come to the conclusion that about 40%, almost half of the Australian teenage girls have a, an iron intake that is too low. And it's starting to appear in toddlers, two to three years old. Um, and they ascribe it to the fact that diets are changing and to the fact that young parents are concerned about red meat. They are unsure, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to deal with that. And that creates um, a, a less robust approach to nutrition. We have a similar effect coming out of the United States. You see it in, in the title, changing diets mean more Americans are anemic now. And very often the conversation is um, at the level of protein. And the common assumption is that in the West we're having too much protein and we're eating the wrong kind of protein. And so it's a lot about animal protein. And this is a, a poster that is distributed in, in, in the States, specifically in, in the schools of uh, New York, for instance, uh, arguing for meatless Monday. So what they say is that most Americans eat one and a half times more protein than they actually should. And they talk about an excessive amount of protein coming from meat. Oh. <clears throat> now, this number is not completely untrue, again, as was the case with the, with the emissions, but it is uh, framing the issue in, in the wrong way because 
this uh, is reflecting an average of a population. And it is, this, this is not being met by substantial parts within that population. A lot of people don't meet that target. This is the average. And furthermore, this is a minimum value. So th the value they're using as a benchmark is the actual minimal value that you need to avoid the loss of muscle mass. And that has been estimated in, in young adults. So it's not an optimal one. Actually, if, if you would um, optimize protein intake for health, you sometimes need two or three times that dose if you're talking about vulnerable populations, if you're talking about uh, aging people that have to deal with sarcopenia, if you, have to, uh, if, if you have to factor in lactation or pregnancy, people that want to build muscle, and the chronically ill, or, or the acute ill as well, the, the, the diseased ones, need more protein than is being uh, suggested by the, by the um, RDA values. You can get there with plants, but it would also mean that for the same amount of protein, you will have to uh, have a higher intake. You would have to combine plant sources, and, and it, it leads to higher caloric intake as well at the same time. So it can be done. It's, I'm not saying that it cannot be done, but it's, it's more complicated. And we really have to ask the question, is it appropriate for everybody within the population? Because some people just don't tolerate many of the vegetable protein sources. They may have allergies. They may not like the taste or they may not even know how to prepare them. It's not all that easy to make a good plate of lentils if you're, not, if you're completely unfamiliar with it. Or you can argue, you can, you can learn that, and that's true, of course. But it's, we need to think about practical implications if we're going to suggest that we need a protein shift. But my main, my main problem with the protein shift is something else. It's a very misleading perspective. And this is probably coming from the technical uh, fact that protein within, especially within the uh, Anglo-Saxon vocabulary is, is, is indicating or is representative of the entire group of animal source foods. Now, this is not only about protein. Those foods bring in many other nutrients, and we should pay attention to those. And a lot of the transition, a lot of the uh, imitation products are basically consisting of protein. Protein is at the center. It's about pea protein isolate or soy protein isolate combined with refined oils and then texturized, as in, in this example from, from Beyond Meat. But people, uh, some scientists are worried that this focus on protein, quali on protein quality and quantity um, just distracts us from, from other needs and at the same time will reduce the nutrient density and the availability of many of those other key nutrients that are overlooked. And eventually, this will also affect the nutritional assessments. Now, this is a bit small, and I will not go into details, but this is an example of what happens if you factor in protein quality and talk about, and about the impact on emissions on the top or land use at the bottom. And you see the different bars, and I will not give you the details now, but those bars shift around. They, they change dramatically if you factor in um, essential amino acids. And yes, again, one can combine foods and combine foods to cover the nutritional spectrum, but it's not all that easy and straightforward. So you need an integration of environmental assessments and nutritional assessments if you want to do a proper job. And that's hardly being done. One of the few attempts at doing so is the Lancet diet. They try to integrate both environment and nutrition. Um, so the Eat Lancet diet is probably known to most of you. It's uh, essentially, it's a well, you can call it flexitarian or semi-vegetarian or quasi-vegetarian. It allows for animal source foods, but in very small quantities. And it's presented as a diet for the planet. Um, but it's good to know that this diet has been designed on nutritional grounds. This has, the design of this diet has not been in, um, taking into account environmental calculations. It's based on health impact. And then, it has, and then it has been compared with planetary boundaries in the next stage. And that's admitted by the science director of the, of the EAT Foundation. Um, and you see, for instance, here how beef and starchy, starchy vegetables exceed the health boundaries. So it's not the planetary boundaries. It's talk, this is specifically talking about the health boundaries. That's a very interesting issue because what we see here is that the, the, the attention or the interest in essential nutrition, which is the classical approach to nutrition since, since decades, has been shifting, and that happens after the, especially after the, the 1970s, to, a, to the field of nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. 
So we're not talking all that much anymore about essential nutrients, we're talking about the impact on chronic disease. And this is basically suggesting that the benefits of the essential nutrients are overshadowed by the harms of the overconsumption by of those animal source foods, to the point of being replaceable. Now, this goes far. Um, th uh, this is what I'm showing here is the is um, a citation and, and a screenshot from the from documents from the Food and Land Use Coalition, and this is the example for Australia. So the the Eat Lancet diet is supposed to be implemented worldwide. It's a planetary health diet. The scenario for, for Australia has been specified, uh, as you see here, and it would imply a 90% reduction in red meat. So I've just mentioned the issues uh, re re related to, to iron intake. So this means uh, further complication of, of iron intake. And um, so there's a pathway towards that Eat Lancet diet in the next, in the next years. And to do so, uh, several agendas have decided that, they, and this is coming from the Food and Land Use Coalition, that they will go deep into the policy of countries, the regulatory environments and businesses, and so forth. And they have identified a couple of priorities, which are Colombia, Indonesia, Ethiopia, but later also the Nordic countries, Australia and, and Europe. Now this sounds, of course, very radical, and you can ask yourself, will this ever happen? Can this ever be achieved? Well, the one thing you, would, you have to take into account is that these efforts, these players are integrated in massive and very influential public-private partnerships. As you see here, this is one example. There are many different constellations, but this is the Global Commons Alliance, where you will find the EAT Foundation and several players involved in the Food and Land Use Coalition, um, and, and those kind of setups that involve lots of multinational uh, corporations. So these are very powerful platforms and they're part of the conversation. Now within um, those constellations, you see a cl very clear uh, influence of the World Economic Forum. We've seen it also in the United Nations Food System Summit. There was a lot of criticism um, going in that direction from several grassroots organizations. And the EAT Foundation has uh, clearly defined itself as a Davos for food. So that's their model. It, it has been modeled on the World Economic Forum. So this is also a, a, a message coming from the World Economic Forum. We all need to go on the planetary health diet to save the world. Now, is this hypothetical? Is this just about um, creating scenarios? Well, we, we, we see the first signs already of practical implementation. One of the partners in, that, in, in this alliance is the C40 Cities Initiative. Now this has um, happened a while ago, and um, within the C40 Cities Initiative, there's a food component, and within that food component, the mayors of 14 global cities have pledged to achieve the planetary health diet by 2030. And that includes major cities indeed, we're talking about Barcelona and Milan and, and Toronto, and their target, as, as this is coming from their document, the progressive target would be to achieve the Eat Lancet suggestion. That means 16, 16 kilo, kilograms of meat per person per year or 90 kilograms of dairy. But their ambitious target is zero meat and zero dairy. Those are radical scenarios. And we see some signs appearing in public canteens um, in, in cities like Barcelona and, and in Milan. This is um, coming from the London commitments where they say that they will align to the planetary health diet and shift the diets away from what they call unsustainable and unhealthy diets. Now unhealthy diets is also the terminology being used in the Eat Lancet report. This is one of their key recommendations. So it's shifting away from unhealthy foods such as red meat and sugar. So they, they are lumping red meat and sugar in the same sentence and clearly defining them as unhealthy foods. But even though this is a very loud message, be aware that this is not consensus within the nutritional field. Um, in, two, was it, in 2019, uh, a series of articles was published by the Nutrix Consortium that looked comprehensively at the state of the evidence using a quality assessment based on the great methodology to see what, the, what, what was the, the weight of, of, of the actual evidence out there. And their conclusion was, well, we don't see very hard evidence and we actually suggest to continue what you're doing. 
and keep, uh, keep the levels of, um, of red meat consumption as they are today. With a disclaimer, of course, that this is, about, this is only about health. So they're not talking about the environment, they're just talking about the evidence for health. Now this series of articles created a massive and a very um, violent conversation. I recommend this article. Uh, it's um, written by Rita Rubin in, in JAMA, and it uh, details the, the, the whole debate. And uh, so, so what happened is that certain people tried to prevent that those studies were published. Uh, and that includes the, the True Health Initiative, which, is, which has Walter Willett on its board of directors, which is the main designer of the Lancet diet. So they actively prevent, tried to prevent publication of scientific literature because it didn't align with their views. And, and essentially this reflects a clash within the nutritional sciences between two fractions. Now the one fraction is the one coming from the uh, Nutrix Consortium, where you have Gordon Guyatt, which is one of the founding fathers of evidence, of the concept of evidence-based medicine, and one of the designers of the GRADE approach. And GRADE is, is the gold standard in, in the medical, uh, medical field. It's used by over, over 100 organizations as the methodological framework to qualify and to judge evidence. And then on the other hand, so this is coming from a, public, a recent publication from the Nutrix people. So, so um, let me say that again. So what they are arguing is that in, in their opinion, the standards of evidence across health fields should be identical. So they see no reason why nutrition should not have the same standards of evidence. In contrast, what they label as the most vocal nutritional epidemiologist, which is a kind way of identifying those people that try to launch a smear campaign against them, talking about conflicts of interest, um, those people will say that we cannot apply grade in nutrition and we have to accept lower standards of evidence. And they suggest the nutrient-grade approach, which is interestingly now the designer of the nutrient-grade approach is now endorsing grade over his own approach. So there's a whole debate there and it's epistemological basically because it's, it is about how do we look at evidence? Which level of evidence do we accept? So the Nutrix people said, uh, essentially their argument comes down to three points. The first one is that the, the indication that um, meat is causing uh, disease is, is leading to a very trivial absolute risk reduction. So the, the absolute risk involved is very small. Moreover, we're not even sure if that is a real effect because the evidence, the quality of the evidence is low to very low, depending on the disease you're looking at. And then they say as a third point, well, people like their meat, so we don't see any reason why we should interfere. Let me just briefly illustrate what this, what this is about. The, the absolute risk point is, um, is the contrast between the relative risk, which is informative for scientists. I mean, it's a very informative number, um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's actually not the, the risk you would like to communicate. A more meaningful risk to, in, to inform the population and policymakers is the absolute risk. The relative risk is, is, a, is a scientific metric that should be communicated, but it should be communicated together with the absolute risk. And that changes the entire picture because the relative risk is usually something in the order of 18% or more. So that's an, that's an impressive number. If you say that eating so much meat will lead to a risk of 18%, you think about it. However, this same number can also be stated in, an, in a different manner. And it's, it's stated here, so let me just read it out. So the risk that somebody will not develop colorectal cancer during a lifetime will shift from 94 to 93% when they eat lots of processed meat. So that's a 1% risk difference. And that gives you a completely different feel and you're not all that concerned anymore. But interestingly, we're not even sure if this is a risk at all in the first place to begin with. It could be, but we're not really sure. And that's because the, the associations are so small. If we're talking about colon cancer, people, with, people of the highest visceral fat category, with most visceral fat, have a risk on colon, colorectal cancer of six, six times the, 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 the baseline risk. So that's an amplification with six. That's a very serious amplification, and that's a serious relationship. And that is very likely causal, also because they're very we're pretty sure about the, the actual mechanisms involved, biologically speaking. 
If you talk about red meat, you would have to multiply the risk with a factor 1.2, actually 1.18 if we're talking about 18% relative risk. So that's a number very near to one. And if you multiply something with a number very near to one, you get almost the same number. That's a weak association. So if you have such a weak association, you're not sure that this data is reliable. And that's why they talk about low evidence. Because we also know that this data can be confounded amongst others by healthy user bias. Heavy meat eaters tend to be more unhealthy people. They tend to smoke more, drink more alcohol, be less physically active, uh, have lower quality diets in general, and have just lifestyles that are le less healthy. Uh, and you can correct for a number of, 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 of things. You can statistically correct for smoking and obesity and so forth. That's not always being done in the first place. And even if it's being done, you cannot get rid of the residual confounding that may be there. So you're never really sure. So th this means, and this no normal practice would be that you're careful about how you state those associations. And this is indeed a major problem nowadays. Within the field of nutrition, and you see it here, these authors are plainly stating that we're dealing with a systemic problem. We're dealing with um, a dangerous existential problem for the field because it's undermining the credibility. Causal language should be used with care. You can only be causal if you're really sure about the mechanism and, and, uh, and the data. And, it's, and actually, if you go to the World Health Organization, for instance, they're actually doing a proper job. They will say that eating meat is associated with certain diseases, but it has not yet been established as a cause of cancer. And they talk about chance and bias and confounding and the fact that they cannot be ruled out. So there's a certain, a certain reservation there, which is the proper way of reporting it. And yet you see these kinds of publications. This is a very recent one published in Nature Foods and mediatized, you see it on the left there. It's individual dietary choices can add or take away minutes, hours, and years of your life. And then this refers to a study that claims that if you eat a hot dog, you lose half, half an hour of, per hot dog of healthy life. And interestingly, if you look at apple pie, it's a neutral effect because the fruits compensate for the fat, right? So these are completely pointless studies, and yet they end up in nature foods. And it's a worrying state of affairs because this, for instance, is a, this is a major concern. This is, these are some screenshots or some, um, some data sets coming from the Global Burden of Disease study. Now, this is a very important study because it informs policy worldwide. It's also, it's, it also has been the basis of the Eat Lancet diet for a part. I mean, it, it, it was used in the calculations. Uh, and it's, it's, it's central to policy making and to, to public health nutrition. Uh, and to many other fields of, of uh, society. But traditionally, so on the left you see the data from 2017, and you see a red meat being indicated, but it's a tiny little bar, you, you almost don't see it. And that's actually what I've shown in the previous slides. We're talking about those associations, and they're small. Now in the new version, which shows the data of 2019, you always have a bit of delay, the, that bar has exploded with a factor um, 30 to 40. And they justify that by saying, well, look, now we found causal evidence because we did new analysis, um, but they don't show the data. And we asked for the data, so we sent the letter to the Lancet, and they refused to give it to us. And at the same time, they also said that, well, one of, one of, the, one of the other things we did is change the TMRL value. The TMRL value is the theoretical minimum risk exposure level. So that's the, that's the, the dose you need to get harmful effects. And that was set at 20 grams per day, and now suddenly it's become zero. So that means that every little bite of meat you're taking is becoming toxic, according to that assumption, without any, any justification whatsoever. At the same time, forgetting about the benefits of meat. So if you're talking about health effects of meat, there's, there's the pros and cons, and, and that's, that's just being ruled out. And in the end, it's, it's, the conversation should be elsewhere. The conversation should be about dietary context. It should be about how you compose your diet, not about specific foods. Uh, because we see that those associations that we measure are usually found in the United States. If you do the same kind of studies in Europe, they tend to be smaller or disappear. And if you do them in other regions, such as Asia, you see sometimes an inversion, where the more meat means better health, which is again an artifact, probably, because it means that people that are richer get, get, better, get better health. And so it's, it's, it's a reflection of society. It's actually your measure, you're capturing the effects of the upper middle classes. That's what, that's what nutritional epidemiology is basically doing. <clears throat> but then if you stratify differently, for instance, in this study obtained from, from 
Canadian data, you see that uh, in the population of people that eat very low amounts of vegetables and fruits, there is a positive association with red meat. So the more red meat, the more cancer. But if you look at the people that eat lots of fruits and vegetables, it, you, you get a protective association. Now, to be fair, it's not a significant one, but the, there's a trend there. So, so you see that the, the relationship just flips around. So it's something else is going on. Either the vegetables and fruits are protective, or it's about the, mark, the marker of the lifestyle. We, we don't really know, but it's, it's about the context of the diet and not about the food as such. That's why this whole classification scheme doesn't make a lot of sense. This is the classification offered by IARC, which is an expert panel connected to the World Health Organization. And it's quite famous. It classifies processed meats as a category one carcinogen and red meat as 2A. But what, we, what you need to understand is that this is a reflection of hazards. So this is a hazard uh, identification. So they identified those products as hazards. Now, a hazard is not a risk. It's not the same thing. It's, to put it simply, uh, to, put it, to put it in a simple manner, a shark would be a hazard as such, but it's the actual swimming with the sharks that is the, that is the risk. Right? It's about exposure, it's about how you are confronted with it. And interestingly, being a hairdresser is at the same level of red meat. Nobody tells you that you cannot have a haircut because you, know, you get the idea. And, and more interestingly maybe is, is the fact that sunlight is a class one, so it's like processed meats. And we know that the sun is, of course, can be harmful if the exposure is problematic. But it's also benign and it's also actually good for us. For one of, one of the reasons being that it gives us a vitamin. So the analogy with meat is there. Um, and actually the avoidance of sun exposure has been identified as a risk factor for all-cause mortality. That's why some scientists are saying now this, this, this approach is, is outmoded and it's neither in the service of science nor society, nor society, and it comes with a lot of unintended downsides and, and, and trade-offs. Um, and that relates to health cares and economic costs and loss of beneficial products and so forth. So, it, uh, nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's the basis of creating such ideas as a meat tax. You know, it, it has to do with the environmental impact, but it also has to do with the, with the health uh, perceptions. And the problem is, if you, if you base yourself on, on that kind of thinking you, and you advocate for a meat tax, well, you will have to understand that it will also come with socioeconomic losses and other effects. So there's always something else happening. If you introduce a change into a complex system, the system will react in unpredictable ways. Complex systems cannot be predicted or, or very difficult to predict. So there are always trade-offs and things happening. One of the things we may expect is socioeconomic losses, um, but also this is about the UK situation where this, the first suggestions of, of a meat tax have been um, tuned down because some people were worried about the fact that the population would start to complain and, and the possibility of food riots. Now this is not new, we've seen that it, with the French Revolution was largely driven by access to meat, but we've seen it also in Chile in the early tw in 20th century where we had meat riots because meat was taken, taken away from the population, the population revolted. We've seen the thing happening in Poland as well in, in the early 80s. So you can expect, of course, lots of societal um, effects. Um, but more, more worrying, even, more, more, more potentially more devastating even, is the fact that um, we, we will end up with nutritional changes and those will, ha will have repercussions on on public health. This graph shows you a list of countries and it uh, gives you the, the meat consumption levels per country. And you see that some countries eat a lot, other countries eat little amounts of meat. And the little dots are giving you the um, percentage of stunting. Now the red line is the line suggested by the Eat Lancet diet. So you can have anything below that line. You can also have a vegan approach of the, to, the, to the Eat Lancet diet. That's, that's you know, one of their options, but you cannot, in principle, go, go much higher. Now, interestingly, those countries that are fitting within the Eat Lancet recommendations are the ones that display the highest stunting levels. We're talking about 30 to 40 percent of stunting in young children in countries like India and, and Bangladesh. Now, of course, this is also a graph where you have to be careful about correlation and causation, because this confounding here as well. 
poverty, infections, and so forth. But it's a warning sign. It's a warning sign that tells us to be careful about very radical uh, interventions in the food system. We also have data from the West. There's data from the Netherlands from the 90s uh, where they looked into microbiotic diets. And ma the microbiotic diet looks very much like the Atlanta diet. It's almost the same recommendations. And they saw the same thing. They saw retarded growth, muscle wasting, uh, slower development, deficiencies, especially in children. So if you're talking about health advice and the repercussions it will have for the environmental debate, we really need to get our priorities right because we know that there are undeb undebatably so problems linked to the Western type of diets. I mean, there's a problem with the ultra-processed foods. There's a problem with the Western approaches uh, that we are seeing today that are not uh, restricted to the Western area anymore, but they're, they're pervasive. They're becoming influential at the global scale. And that's a major problem, and nobody will debate that. And the problem is one of excessive body fat, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, chronic inflammation, that's where the problem is. And that's because of the Western diet. It is not because of an evolutionary food. And yes, you can produce meat in the wrong ways. If you put it on a barbecue and it's black afterward, you mean you better not eat it. And some people may have to think about their iron intake because they're prone to toxic levels of iron. There, there are issues that you have to think about, but it's about the dietary pattern. It's about how you compose your daily meals. And that should be the priority. And it's a simple thing but it's hardly being addressed. So this brings me almost to the end of the presentation, just maybe some, some final conclusions. Um, don't let people tell you that meat is an unhealthy food. That's an absurd statement. I mean, red meat as such is not an unhealthy food. It offers you key nutrients that in many cases are difficult to obtain through alternative approaches. It can be done. I'm not saying it cannot be done. It can be done, but it's less robust. It needs more thinking. It needs um, more elaboration. So it's less straightforward. And it may not always be enough for the vulnerable populations. Within wholesome diets, within wholesome dietary approaches, there's just no good evidence for harm. And the violent pushback to the Nutrirex studies shows that this is not only about the science. Yes, there is an impact on the environment, but it is contextual as for any food. You can find problematic scenarios for plant foods. Um, and it's really about the proper integration of plant and animal agriculture. It's about, uh, sorry, this jumped around. It, 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 it's the integration, it's the proper way of doing things with both animals and, and plants that will give you the ecological benefits. And yes, interventions are needed. Things need to be done. This is not over. The, the livestock needs to change. There are challenges there. We cannot leave them unaddressed. But they should be based on the best of science and on practical wisdom. Any technocratic intervention, which is radical with the food system, will come with pushback and will, have, will create damage. We need to do this with care and on, in an evidence-based manner. And the last point here is something that is quite important, I think, and it's often overlooked in those discussions. I hardly see anybody addressing this, but meat is so much more than nutrients. It is, we're talking about livelihoods, we're talking about tradition, we're talking about craftsmanship, about commensality, and that needs to be shown because that's also part of our human relationship with, with meat. And we may have to, well, me, I mean you, <laughs> uh, may have to be more focused on the strengths, really, instead of being reactive, because it's always a reactive conversation. It's always apology. I hear a lot of apologies, but I want to see those assets. I want to see the strengths being presented. And uh, those strengths are absolutely there, and they're multiple, and they're robust. They, they're evidence-based but they need to be shown. Because if, they, if, if you don't show them as an industrial sector, people can as well buy the imitations. If they don't understand that there is a difference, they will buy the imitations because it comes with promises. So as long as they don't identify, as long as they are not shown why the uh, actual 
animal source foods and meat in particular in, to, in today's setting has its value, well, they, they will switch. That's the challenge for the future. Uh, I, would, um, I will end with this slide, and this is just for your information. On the right side, you will find a link to a website which, um, which I have started um, not so long ago, and it's, a con it's, it's being um, it's brought by a consortium of, about, of over 40 scientists that are increasingly concerned about the state of affairs in, in academia. And we are uh, bringing a, a, a white paper uh, containing hyperlinks to the original source material, talking about the planet, talking about human health, also talking about ethics. Uh, you'll find a lot of information there. It's a bit technical, but it's, I think it's a good resource and I would like to invite you to come and visit it. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Rick, I think that was fantastic, and I think uh, for me, what you do is you put confidence behind some of the statements we can make. We don't make those statements loud enough, but actually you've put uh, the foundations there, and I'm sure there will be no end of questions coming forward, so thank you. Uh, I'd just like to introduce you uh, to our panel. Uh, we've got Xin Huang on my right, who is the Secretary General of the International Meat Secretariat, known to many of you, I am sure, uh, who has come over from Paris, for which we are eternally grateful. Uh, Laura Ryan, who I'm sure is known to uh, most people in the room. Uh, Laura is the international chairman of the Meat Business Women, uh, but also known for many other reasons, including uh, the Global Meat Alliance, which Laura has got up and running, and I'm sure we will hear uh, more about that. Uh, and finally, uh, Clive Black, who is the founding director and head of research at Shaw Capital Markets, uh, an independent financial services uh, business, but also someone who has worked with many, many food businesses over the years. Uh, and I'm sure many of us have heard uh, you speak before, Clive, and looking forward to having your uh, input into the discussion. But what I'd like to do, before I turn to, uh, to you in the audience, uh, and I am keen that we have plenty of time for questions from you, is just pose one question to each of our panelists uh, to take no more than five minutes, I promise, Bob, they have all promised me, uh, just to set the scene in terms of how you see it. So, Shin, I'd like to turn to you first. Um, Frederick has set out brilliantly the sort of the wider context here. Many people in this room will be engaged, particularly in the UK meat market. We see it from a UK context. Can you just tell us a little bit more from, a, from an international meat secretariat? What's going on elsewhere in the world? How do the issues that Frederick's touched on manifest themselves uh, in Europe, beyond Europe, elsewhere in the world as, as you see things? Well, uh, thank you very much it's, uh, for inviting me here tonight. It's uh, really a, a pleasure and honor to be here. And I want to f start first by underlining the importance of what Frederick has just presented to us in terms of a healthy diet, having uh, not being just a single diet, but being very context specific. And so we do here in, I suppose, you have a UK centric view. I'm from France with a French centric view. There is a Euro centric view. And in general, we do, we have been talking tonight about the challenges facing developing country, Western, rich country views of things. Um, but of course, we know that there's also a developing country point of view in which for them, meat is seen as something nutritional and good. They still have a good, good image of it. There's the Asian uh, view, which is different. You know, traditionally, we, we as Asians eat less meat as a proportion of, of a total diet. And these can all be good diets, or they can be bad diets, but meat is not, you know, the meat is part of the diet. Or in other words, demonizing a single food is just, there's no science to it. And I think that's really the value of uh, Frederick's presentation tonight. From my perspective, thank you very much. Really brilliant. What has been done around the world in terms of the, um, uh, what we have seen at the International Meat Secretariat, very close to home, uh, the European Livestock Voice. Uh, it, they have a web page. I invite you to look at it as a brilliant representation of the contributions of livestock and meat industry, and even a picture with a slider of what it means 
with animals and what it means without animals in terms of employment, economic activity, et cetera, brilliant. In New Zealand, they have annually an Iron Awareness Week in which they have uh, famous athletes showcasing the benefits of um, uh, meat in the diet. The Australian Dietary Guidelines, uh, there is a study that is very recently, just these last few days, being published on the impact of uh, first, whether Australian dietary patterns are healthy, and then secondly, the impact on, on the environment and, and health. And, it, and basically, to spoil it for you, basically, they find that the current diet is not that far from, um, from what is, would be considered scientifically uh, a good, uh, appropriate uh, for human health and for, for, for uh, the environment. In France, they've done something brilliant. Uh, you have heard the term flexitarian which I looked it up in a dictionary and apparently it was uh, a term that, it is a term that has been appropriated by vegetarians as, as meaning they're flexible. And actually the French meat industry has said, well, we're flexitarian too. And you can be flexitarian and be proud of it. So they've actually uh, uh, walked into vegetarian, uh, traditional vegetarian territory, a brilliant ad campaign. In Uruguay, they have something in the first thousand days of life from conception to the first couple of years of life in an infant, uh, uh, the benefits of meat uh, for physical development, cognitive development. Uh, closer to home, Quality Meat Scotland, AHDB, uh, Meat Promotion Wales have had a very strong presence in terms of explaining the benefits of the meat industry at the COP26. Uh, the USDA Protein Pact, I could go on, but I mean, just let, let me, if I may, just take a minute because I think I'm running out of yeah, time. Right. Uh, just, you know, well, what do we do? about the sad state of affairs. Because in the very Western-centric view, we, we, I, 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 we are in a very sad state of affairs. Because we are not seen to be an industry that um, we are not seen favorably, right? And, and why is that? Well, first of all, we need to discredit the bad science. I think Frederick has done a brilliant job of that. We need to push that back. I'm a little bit worried that the nutrition science that is really enjoyed uh, a, a lot of spotlight with the Eat Let's Eat Diet, that there's not enough pushback on it. We need to push back on that. We do need to engage the critics. I'm speaking to you as a friendly audience. Uh, people like me should also be speaking to people that are not friendly to meat. That's something we all need to, to do. Um, most importantly, give, have a good relationship with your government officials, with your levy boards, uh, whoever they, they, they are. You have to have this conversation. You have to give your Minister of Agriculture ammunition when he goes to COP26 the next time when they actually do talk about livestock. You have to give them ammunition when they're at the Food System Summit discussions, all right? You absolutely need to feed them, and you have to give them ammunition against the Minister of Health and the Minister of the Environment. Very important, okay, because they're feeling very lo lonely out there. Uh, it's a very complicated topic. And then I just really do want to insist, and on a positive note, be proud of what we're doing. We can be proud of what we're doing. Livestock is an important part of sustainable development. We can be an important part of the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That is the main tenet of the International Meat Secretariat. Uh, and then just, I, I, I want to um, maybe provoke you a little bit and ask the question. I don't have all the answers, but are we, have you been selling meat for too cheap? It is such a good, high quality, nutritious product. And we've succeeded marvelously at making it available cheaply to everybody. And maybe in that sense, we have devalued it a little bit or people have taken it for granted. Are we selling it too cheap? And just leave, let me leave you with this thought because you're thinking, yeah, but if we raise the price, they buy less. Well, do you think Apple has had that experience? Tesla? Thank you. Thank you, Shin. Uh, yeah. And you're also perfectly on time, so well done. Um, Laura, I want to turn to you next, and, and look, we're in an audience here of the meat industry. Um, time and again, and Shin touched on this, the meat industry loves talking to the meat industry about the meat industry, right? We're all going to sit here and agree with each other. You, you have a lot of experience in terms of where the consumer's coming from. So, so what is it that the consumer's saying in this area? What is it we need to consider um, from their perspective? Am I on the stopwatch now? You're all right, yeah. Right, good. So for me, I think it's really worth saying, and, and Frederick's articulated it brilliantly within uh, 
in his speech there that the meat industry, not only nationally but globally, I think is at massive crossroads. And we need to really sort of reflect on what's been said tonight and we can't walk out of this room thinking everything's going to be fine because I genuinely don't believe it is. Um, what I do see, though, is the data showing 45% of consumers here in the UK are wanting to eat meat and wanting to arguably even eat more meat. But what we're seeing is 35% of people are unconsciously eating, uh, unconsciously reducing, sorry, the amount of meat they're eating. And about 20% are flexitarians, as, as Shin's spoken about. And that data is pretty similar for here and also the US. So it, it's, it's a global, uh, global play. So to answer your question, I think there's four things we should be doing. First of all is collaboration. And Shin's articulated it really well, what we're doing globally with IMS, Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, um, Global Meat Alliance. There's a lot of players in this space, but we're lacking a global strategy. And that's the problem. We're so fragmented. And we really want to talk about our own production systems, levy boards, farming unions, and I get that. But what we need to do is come together pre-competitively on these are the things we're going to play on together. We haven't quite nailed that, and we need to. We're seeing other sectors do that really well. Dairy, for example, the global dairy platform have got a real clear strategy. Meat industry haven't. We're fragmented. Uh, the second thing is about creating uh, clarity and uh, uh, builds on Shin's point. The meat industry is um, viewed, and, and Frederick articulated it as well, as traditional, reactive, and, and really defensive. We need to change that narrative. It's in the lapse of our power to be able to change that. Speaking to CEOs of processes, it's really interesting to see them wanting to invite folks that wouldn't naturally be invitees to their plants that would maybe sometimes even do secret filming in their sheds, for example, legally into their businesses to see what they're doing and be transparent. We need to be more transparent. And we always counter emotion against our sector with science. We need to counter some emotion with emotion as well to Frederick's last slide. We're so passionate about it, and it's a great sector. We can do more. Point three is around uh, commu communications and consumer communications. We need to match our values with those values of our consumers. We see other categories doing that amazingly well. Walk down the, that meat-free aisle, it's telling you in a really funky tone of voice why you should be picking up that product. Because of the way our categories um, put together, it's not doing that, and we can evolve it. And yes, that's a challenge between retail and processors, but I truly believe, be it brands or be it different tiering in store, we can talk about health, sustainability, and all of those softer touch points that are truly important to consumers. And then last, but by no means least, because he's giving me the side eye, is because uh, is, is consistency. We're really good at some of this, some of the time, but we never switch it on permanently. This can't be something that we play at and we do for three months of a year and then drop back out of. We need to make sure we've got a plan and it's switched on all the time. It's part of business as usual. And it's really interesting chatting to processes how much that ES SG agenda is central to their businesses, we need to make sure that this communications piece is central as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> and uh, finally, before I hand over to you, the audience, so please get your, your thinking caps on. I want to turn to you, Clive. You work uh, with all components in the supply chain. Uh, you know, from retail through food service, manufacturers, but you're also working with investors who themselves have their own ESG uh, 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 elements in this that I think sometimes we probably ignore or don't think about. What are you picking up from those other either sectors in the food industry, parts of the supply chain, or the investor community that can be so influential here? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I uh, have to congratulate uh, Professor Leroy on that paper. Uh, I uh, chair the Industrial Advisory Board at Queen's in Belfast, and you've got some friends over there, and Chris Elliott and Alice Stanton, and you do have to um, call out the science, because the pollution of science is, is more than just meat, actually. Um, in terms of uh, investors, um, we were talking to you today on the day Beyond Beef had another profit warning, uh, I should add. Um, investors are becoming uh, more active uh, and they're also becoming more a single issue. So the boards of Tesco uh, and Sainsbury's in particular, who have to sit in front of investors at an AGM, uh, are now having resolutions around ESG, but also HFSS uh, participation in their assortments. 
So this is here and now. Um, the chap um, in your uh, slide uh, who was talking to investors about ending meat, um, he's doing that because he's got a financial interest to do that. He doesn't care about meat or animals. He doesn't care about the countryside. He doesn't care about the people who eat his burgers. That is purely financial, and that has to be called out. So we have actually, um, Alice Stanton presented to all our bankers, uh, and the sense of um, absolute dismay that the Lancet wouldn't reveal the data um, was you know, palpable. That has to be called out. Uh, but what I'm also clear about is the meat industry can't talk about that. You know, the meat industry can't be the people calling for the Lancet to reveal the data. You know, science has to do that. Courts have to do that. Um, the, uh, the civil service and the agencies involved in education need it. So, you know, I worked at the NFU um, when I was wearing shorts and uh, it was half the size I am now. So I have supported the meat industry and the beer industry, believe me. But um, in, terms of, um, in terms of getting your messages across, and really profound messages, uh, you have to uh, draw upon reputable people elsewhere in society. The meat industry telling uh, society that beef is safe goes back to John Gummer stuffing a beef burger down his daughter's throat and saying, don't worry about BSE. It just doesn't work. Um, but in terms of supply chains, you've got to remember supply chains will follow the money. Uh, and in that respect, uh, if people want to eat less meat, then supermarkets will sell them less meat. Uh, so uh, to my mind, there are four key themes uh, in modern food systems that will determine your future. Uh, and you can't be passive on this. Uh, animal welfare. If you think shoppers aren't interested in animal welfare, then you shouldn't be in the livestock trade. The environment. Um, we were talking before about COP26. I don't know about you, but um, people, normal people, are talking about the environment uh, in a way that they didn't a year ago, in a way they didn't 10 years ago, and so forth. If you're not part of the solution to the environment, then the beef industry, the animal industry, is doomed. And there's great work, scientific work, ongoing. In Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and in uh, the Republic, they've already got a carbon-neutral beef and dairy farm. Um, and it involves topography and hydrology and aspect, mixed farming, clover and herbs, old-fashioned farming in a digital age. That's the solution. Farming has to embrace that. If it doesn't, it's doomed. And the other two areas that are really important is convenience. Uh, people um, will continue to want access to food in an easy way. Uh, and uh, sustainability, animal welfare, convenience morph together into a product assortment that, uh, that retailers, food service businesses, bankers uh, will want to support. So the future is in your hands. You've got some big problems. If you don't address those problems, I'll say it again, you are doomed. But believe me, your pint is more than half full. Uh, and go and fill it. Brilliant. Thank you, Clive. Okay, so we're going to open up for questions. Uh, as uh, was said at the start, please don't start asking your question until the microphone has got to you. Uh, we have a couple of microphones floating around. Now, what I don't know, I doubt we have got a microphone upstairs. So I apologize for those that are in the, uh, the upstairs seats. Uh, I suspect your ability to, to ask a question or the availability will be limited, but we may have to try. Um, but look, who'd like to ask the first question? We'll have a microphone down the front here to Mike. And if you could just introduce yourself as well, that would be good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mike Gooding from Farmers Fresh. We're a lamb cooperative processing business. I'd like the panel to get down into some really nitty-gritty detail because what's clear, at least in the UK, is that uh, policy is not based on science. Um, in fact, it's increasingly difficult to understand what UK policy is actually uh, based on at the moment. But in reality, and despite the hard work of many of the people who are in this room, um, policy is about in the UK is about carbon, carbon, and carbon. Mm. In fact, I had it quoted to me uh, just the other day. So we've actually failed to engender that balanced uh, argument. The professor talked, and I absolutely agree about the positives, and we've talked about being on the front foot, to use a cricketing metaphor. So what practical strategies 
do the panel suggest we should be adopting to try and bring some balance back into the policy debate? Okay, I'm not going to uh, give every question to every panellist because that always drags these things out. So, Laura, I'm going to come to you uh, on Mike's question. What is it we need to be doing now, particularly in that policy arena, to start to, to get some different direction? Thanks, Stuart. I thought you might do that. Um, so, I, I, it's, it's a tricky space, and I speak regularly to farmers' unions, trade associations, and, uh, and I know the policy aspect is challenging. What I see working well is where those relationships exist, and even at CEO level of processes, having relationships with their local MPs and, and all the rest of it is essential. And I suppose I see that space evolving where um, the relationship with politicians and, I don't know, deaf officials is more important than, than it previously was. So I see people chunking up more time for that and more influencing on that. I can see within trade there has been some wins, but I can see a lot of frustration as well. And I can see frustration where there's been a huge amount of time spent trying to get policy changes across the board, or across the line rather, and that's not been successful. So in terms of the nitty gritty, what's the answer? My gut says network and push and make sure you're investing the time. Is that always working? Not always, sometimes it is. Okay, please indicate if you, uh, if you want to ask a question. But Clive, anything you want to add to, to what Laura's said? I would uh, listen to the people who consume your product. They're the most important people. Uh, and listening is the first part of changing their, uh, their thought process if they, if they have to change. Uh, and in terms of, um, in terms of the, the makeup of the, the meat industry, the, I said there was four things driving. And the one I didn't mention was well-being, which the professor uh, covered uh, in some detail. Um, in, in presenting your industry, you have to be part of a sustainable and healthy future. Uh, listen to the shoppers. Don't listen to Tesco. Don't listen to, um, certainly don't listen to civil servants. Um, you know, most of them do PP in Oxford. They're called Jeremy, to quote Rod Little, and they're fucking useless. Um, <laughs> go and listen to shoppers and, and consumers and, and for, form your thoughts around them. Find out what they're worried about and deal with it. F feel free to use blunt language if Sorry. you wish. To. <laughs> um, Harriet in the middle there. Hi. Yeah, uh, Harriet Henrik, NFU. Um, I just wanted to uh, possibly ask Frederick first about what he thinks about the nutritional value of lab-based meats, and then possibly uh, anybody else on the panel where they think they'll sit within our industry in the future. Okay, Frederick, lab-based lab meats. Yes, so specifically the nutritional value of it, uh, it, well, it gets closer to actual meat than the plant-based alternatives because it's actually tissue-engineered material coming from myoblasts, from, from meat cells. Uh, that being said, of course, uh, meat also uh, contains those nutrients that come from the soil and from the rumen, and so it's, it's a complicated matter, and you will have to add in things. Um, so it's, it, it, can, it, it will approximate it to a better degree than, than those protein isolate based kind of products. Obviously, the question is, can we produce it? Because that's far from being clear. The thing with lab-based meat is that you need certain standards in place if you produce it. And those standards approximate the standards of the pharmaceutical world, world because it's, you need to avoid contaminations and otherwise your batches will fail. So you need very strict measures in place to be able to guarantee that the production will keep on going. But you cannot produce it at, at pharmaceutical scale because you need huge production levels. If you want to really enter the game, you need huge production levels. And you cannot have both worlds. You cannot ho have pharmaceutical standards in, in a huge scale the production system. So we need, uh, they, they promise a lot, but you have to wonder, is this to, to inflate the investment bubble or is this genuine, <laughs> genuine uh, progress that they're making? We don't see also everything because a lot is protected by IP and so it, not everything is put in the open. So that they still rely on the bovine serum, for instance, but, and they say they have a replacer for that, but we, well, we don't know if it's gonna be economically viable, if it's gonna cover all the, all the, so we don't know. There's lots of things we don't know yet. So one thing is the health aspect and the nutritional value of it. Another thing is, which I would say, yes, it will be better than, than the other things we're seeing, but then can we even see it as a practical solution? Shin. 
So that's a very interesting um, area for profits. And you know, Clive was earlier saying about the profit motive. And clearly, the high-tech investors are seeing huge, huge profit potential here. But can it be? Uh, but first of all, what will they succeed in pr pr producing? Uh, it, it will be a, something that might approximate a hamburger on the best day. You will not get a steak. So I, th I think uh, we should be clear about that. You're not producing tissue, connective tissue, all the complexity of meat. And they need to work out how to put in fats and, and you know, other things that give flavor. But beyond all of that, um, the environmental cost of that is horrendous. Because this is produced basically using CO2 electricity, and you have to produce that somehow. And CO2, by the way, in the climate debate, is, is the thing that we should all be concerned about. Methane less. Okay, let me say that again. Methane less. Methane is something we in the livestock sector, we have a tremendous contribution we can make to reducing our climate impact. CO2, because of the half-life of methane, it's a flow gas, Frederick explained that already. I'm not going to go through that again. But CO2, every molecule of CO2 we put in the atmosphere is up there for hundreds of years, beyond our lifetime, maybe a thousand years. And unless we physically remove it at great cost, that is, has a climate warming impact. Methane, after 12 years, half of its impact is gone, and, and actually even the story can even be better than that. So my point is this, with lab-grown meats, good luck. They think they're going to make a lot of money, a lot of people smarter than I am uh, say that it will never happen. But even if it does, I wouldn't worry about it because there are many other benefits uh, to producing meat uh, using so-called prehistoric technology uh, uh, th that are out there, you know, in, in terms of livelihoods for people in developing countries, livelihoods for people in developed countries, uh, life in the, uh, um, in the countryside, uh, soil, carbon quality. The people that love organic foods, what are they gonna do if there's no manure? Have they thought about that? Uh, I'll stop there. I could go on. <laughs> Thank you, Shin. Okay, who wants to go next? Yeah, over on the left hand side here. But what we'll do, we'll take two questions. So if anyone else wants to put their hand up as well, feel free to. Uh, Jane Buxton, I'm a, an author writing on this subject. Um, and Pat Brown has been mentioned a couple of times today by on the panel uh, in connection with Impossible Foods, and he recently uh, lobbed another hand grenade into the debate with his new model, um, showing that the elimination of all livestock will lead to a 70, 68% actually, reduction in CO2. And a superficial scan through that led me to think this is just nonsense, but I wondered if anyone on the panel had had a chance to dig into that study and whether that is one, the sort of study that we should be responding to in the industry, vocally. Okay, thanks. We'll come on to that one in a second, and there was a question here, guy in a white shirt. <laughs> oh. Oh, we're swapping microphones. Battery's dead, obviously. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have taken two questions at once. That's me being too clever. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Todd May from M&S uh, Supermarkets. First of all, thank you for the, the chats tonight. It's been really insightful. Um, my question's probably two-part. Um, and building on your last slide, Frederick, around the strengths that we need to be talking about more as an industry, um, and then the second part is the how and how we can communicate that and get the cut through. Um, so if you had three strengths that you would, could call out uh, to the everyday customer, not, not people or consumer, not people in this room, um, that are based on fact uh, that you think they need to know that they don't, might not know now, if they're considering to <coughs> cut out red meat from their diets or reduce red meat, um, what would those three things be? Um, and the second part, how do you think as an industry we can communicate those three things better to, to get the cut through that we need? Okay, so first question which is on uh, Impossible Foods' latest claim on CO2. Uh, Frederick, sorry, I'm going to come to you on that one. It's a very specific question uh, and one that uh, certainly raised a few eyebrows at an event I was at the other day, but Frederick. Yes, well, I I'm not sure what but Brown is quoting here, which kind of study is referring to, but we, we hear that, those numbers often, right? And then, uh, so, so I, 
often they say that the entire GWP star approach is creative accountancy. Yeah. Right? That's what you yeah. hear often. Yeah. Well, this is creative accountancy because what they do is they, they bring in things like opportunity costs, for instance. So they say that if we would use all those lands that are now available to livestock farming, if we would just put forests on top of that. And then, so they get to these extreme scenarios and then they come up with these radical, uh, with these inflated numbers. These are not realistic, of course, because you cannot just put, you cannot just forest the whole planet just like that. I mean, it, it depends on your ecological context. And, and in, in many cases, those, those grasslands are just naturally even open ecosystems. We, we have this wrong idea that the planet in this natural state is a forest. That's, that's completely not true. A lot of territory on the planet is actually ecologically speaking, an open system where you integrate trees and grasslands and, and so forth. Uh, so so they, probably they, they're assuming that you can recover, uh, make up your budget by, by doing those kinds of interventions. I don't know. I would have to see the actual material to comment in more detail and more, more fact-based. But I suspect that it brings in opportunity costs and those kinds of creative accountancy tricks that... that uh, Okay, I'm, I'm not going to give you the next one, um, Frederick, because you gave us way more than three positive messages, right? But if I was to say to you, Shind, you are able to embed three messages in every single consumer around the world, around me, what would those three key messages be? Uh, wise use of resources that would otherwise go to waste. So just to explain that a little bit, lands that are not suitable for anything else. The use of, for example, in monogastrics of food materials that would be wasted, thrown in the dumpster if we were not putting them in compound feeds, right? Okay, so wise use of resources, so this is the environmental side. The nutrition side, the clearly strong scientific evidence on the nutritional benefits. If you care to look carefully at what is strong scientific evidence, there is clear positive evidence for that. And then thirdly, I would say the tremendous contribution to sustainable development. These are the goals that us, we all aspire to, whether meat eaters, vegetarians, everyone that lives on the planet aspires to a healthier uh, planet. And a healthy planet means, it doesn't mean that we all go back to the dark ages or we you know, go back to you know, being cavemen and we don't uh, produce things in a modern way. It means we do things in a sustainable way. And livestock production can be a contribution is an important contribution already, but can be the ultimate contribution to sustainable development, something that is a bit more difficult for other industries, extractive industries like coal, for example, be hard pressed to, to make that argument. So, so really, uh, nutrition, uh, wise use of resources, planetary health. And, and I'm not saying there aren't problems, sorry, that, that, that we need to solve. There are tremendous problems we as an industry, we need to answer to. We need to answer them. And that also includes the animal welfare aspect, by the way. Right. Thank you. And, and thank you for also bringing in monogastrics, because too mm -hmm. often yes, we, exactly. we simply fall into a trap of yeah, constantly exactly. talking about ruminants here and yeah. not talking about uh, yeah. monogastrics with the, the opportunities and the mm -hmm. challenges there. So, so Laura, we, we've now got the three messages. We're going to embed it in every consumer on the planet. How the hell are we going to do that? I think we need to accept that every consumer is not the same and I think this is what I was alluding to earlier that when you walk through other categories, let's just say meat free, it's really well segmented to different target audiences. We don't do that in the MFP category. So we need to know our audiences. And I think back to something like Clarkson's Farm, how much the general public really liked understanding the farming story. And I know we try, but we probably can even dial up more telling our story. And depending on who our segment is, tell it in the tone of voice that it matches their values. We don't do enough of that. We hopefully one size fits all and pushes it out because we're such a traditional category. So I think it's understanding our different consumers more and talking to them in that more modern way that, that other categories are. And I think that builds on, on what Clive was saying as well about actually listen to the consumer. Yeah. You know, that key, that key tool to communication is remembering you've got two ears and one mouth and use them in that proportion. And, and, and for me, look, we have got, I genuinely believe, some of the finest farmers in the world, some of the finest meat processors in the world, some of the finest retailers in the world. And we're really good at that. We're just crap storytellers. We've not told our story. We've got a great story and we haven't told it. OK, I'm going to take a couple more questions and then I'm going to have to start drawing it to close. So one in the middle there 
and Dean towards the front who looks like he's had a fight with a bike like I have. So we'll take both questions and then... Uh... Uh, hi, George Edwards here from Direct Meats. I work in meat sales and um, when I do engage in the odd debate with you know, family members who are vegan or flexitarian, often I'm accused of bias. You know, I only get paid if I do sell meat. Um, and Clive made the great point of it shouldn't be the meat industry to have to stand up for ourselves, uh, at least not all the time. So my question is, who is the ideal champion and how do we get them on board? <laughs> great question. Dean. Does this work? Oh, you got your arm as well, snap, Dean. That's snap, very Stuart, snap. snap. <laughs> um, yeah, Dean Holroyd, ABP Food Group. Um, so, some of what we talked about tonight, certainly at the panel, you know, takes money. Okay? Um, collaboration, coordination... Um, seems like a number of things were made up in the Eat Lancet. This might be a bit of another made up number, but I hear it took $20 million just to launch and promote sort of the Eat Lancet. So um, how do we as an industry collaborate, coordinate, generate that type of funds at least to be able to try and counterbalance? Thank you, Dean. Thank you for also really embarrassing me because you've demonstrated you can get a jacket on and wear a <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so we've got two questions, which is who, who tells the story and how do we fund the story? Well, I'm going to come to you, Clive, on the second one of those first. How, how do we get the industry to come together, collaborate, put its hands in its pockets? Because these things do cost money. Yeah, well, look, first of all, don't go and buy a whole load of academics off. I mean, that is... You know, absolutely not the way to go. If we look at the, some of the scandals of the last 50 years, Monsanto, uh, you know, buying off academics, um, that is just not the way forward, just to be very clear. But the voice uh, of Professor Leroy needs to get out. Uh, and, um, you know, go, funny enough, something as, uh, as shallow as just go and talk to people. Go on to Radio 4's Today programme. Go on to Breakfast News. Go on uh, and, and just... You know, go to a football match. I went to see Coventry City beat um, the play <laughs> on Saturday, 3-2 Bristol City, and I had a hot dog, and it was fantastic. And you know, Just listen to people, um, engage with them, uh, and then apply a sensible, strategic, not public relations strategy, because that's spin, um, conversation with the public. The public aren't stupid. They really are not stupid. They're much more switched on than the establishment will th think they are. Uh, and in that respect, if you think the public are stupid uh, and the establishment is clever, look at Brexit and look at Boris Johnson's election. <laughs> now, the establishment is supposed to be switched on. It's supposed to be informed. It's got more data than anyone else put together, and they didn't see two of those things coming. So don't worry about the establishment. Go and talk to people. Simple as it. Have a strategy to communicate sensibly with people. And I should also say, I mean, farm, the livestock farming industry has an amazing tool to deal with your question. It's called bullshit. <laughs> just call it out but there's no point of you know, the livestock industry saying that's bullshit someone else has got to come and say look there's a term that you used in agriculture for many years what you're talking about pal and it's bullshit Shin um, you <laughs> <laughs> look <laughs> I, 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 no, I'm not I'm, I am very tempted but I'm not going there um, Shin you, you engage with consumers everywhere around the world okay mm. We need, and we heard earlier, I think it was you were saying, Frederick, we've got to have consistency in our message here in, in all parts of the planet. This is not just a UK issue. How do we start going about doing some of that? Well, I think one of the most important things we need to do as an industry is uh, stop uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. Because the first thing I hear anywhere I go um, is, you know, our production system is the best in the world. And then when I talk to different associations, they say, well, you know, the pig production system, that's the best because we have the lowest CO2 emissions. And the livestock, the beef guys say, yes, but we're great because we're ruminants. Uh, and then the chicken guy says, yes, but, uh, you know, uh, you are uh, not very efficient. Uh, we are more efficient than you are. And then the fish guys can say we're more efficient. And, and, you know, my point is this. We're all in the same boat. Let's talk about the benefits we bring to the table and let's not do it in a way that denigrates others. So that's the first thing, okay? We're all in the same boat. 
if the public gets the idea that one kind of livestock production is system is bad, they're going to have the idea that all livestock production system is bad. So being the most um, virtuous of a bad lot is not a good place to be, okay? So there are things that we need to compete on, but not on environment, not on animal welfare, not on sustainability. These are non-competitive issues. And we need, we need to be able to, to do that intelligently with the consumer so they understand that, that, that that's the place we're, we're coming from. It's not about just making another buck. I'm from the International Meat Secretariat. Every word I say to a consumer will be taken with a grain of salt. They will not believe me. That's true, yes. But that doesn't prevent people like myself or people like us from presenting the facts plainly in a way that's positive. And I want to really insist on that. There are many positive aspects to livestock production. There are the negatives we have to deal with. We have to own up to those, recognize those, and get rid of those. What are, what are some of these? Deforestation. Um, problems that people have with certain intensive livestock production practices. Notice I'm not saying all intensive productions are, are, are bad. There are people that would have us believe that, but that, that is clearly not true. But we need to be cognizant of, 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 of the issues that are out there. We have to listen to the consumer. Okay. Okay. Uh, in which case, I have now been given a really big glower from somewhere in the second <laughs> row. Uh, so you've got 30 seconds, Laura. You've established the Global Meat Alliance. What can they bring to the party? Yeah, so we're a young organisation. We're only 18 months old, um, and we are funded by about 15 different organisations, but the key funders are Meat and Livestock Australia and uh, BMPA. And we're coming together on a monthly basis to build a single global narrative for the meat industry. So anybody that's interested in that information, it's all fully funded and open to anyone in the meat industry that they can use that information. Uh, just go to globalmeatalliance.org. But basically, uh, to build on Shin's point, because we've got so many production systems, as we know, it's really hard to get that single narrative. And just to play back the question, I would argue we can be our best ambassadors before anything else. But the challenge is, if I speak to a lot of people in this room, we don't know what to say. We don't know what that information is. And we haven't got those key facts. OK, in which case, the very last point, um, Frederick, you have been our guest of honour. You've been brilliant. Every single person in this room can be an advocate and is an advocate for the meat industry. What is the one single message you want everyone here to take out of this room and tell everyone they know? One. That's, that's a lot of pressure. Right? Uh, be scientifically robust. Um, look, I'm, the reason why I'm here is not because I want to offer, I, I'm not want, wanting to work for you. That's not my role. I'm a scientist. My role is to bring you the evidence. I'm concerned about the state of the planet, and I'm concerned about food security, I'm concerned about sustainability. And I think if we're following the technocratic view, we're going to end up with disaster. I'm systematically never, and I understand the point of Monsanto, I'm systematically refusing all speaker fees. I'm not taking any money from the livestock industry, so I'm certainly not getting rich out of this. I'm doing this because I think there's a scientific need to enter that debate. It's not being done enough. It needs to be done. Don't cheat on the message, accept, acknowledge the work you have to do, but be scientifically correct at all stages. Because if you don't, it will backfire. Be, uh, well, that's not there. <laughs> that, 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 that is a brilliant point to end on. Um, can I thank Clive, Laura, Shin, uh, and particularly uh, thank you, Frederick, for coming uh, and kicking off a great discussion. And thank you for the Worshipful Company for putting this on. Uh, and thank everyone else for coming to join us. So please, could we thank our speakers? Thank you. Well done. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Pray silence for a final word from the master of the Worshipful Company of Butchers. A very quick final word, because I should imagine you all want something to eat and drink. Um, but seriously, just to, to echo what Stuart said, thank you so much, Frederick. That was just so informative. I really hate having to close this down now, because I think it could go on for a lot longer. You've really started an interesting debate. And thank you also to the panelists, Laura, Clive, Shin. Um, brilliant conversation. Um, and Stuart, thank you for bringing it all together and nearly in on time. Um, 
I, I just want to say a huge thank you for traveling here because I know you've all traveled here from different parts, but um, sitting and talking to Frederick and Shin beforehand, catching Eurostar from Paris and Brussels is a real challenge to get here. So thank you so much for doing all that. Uh, my takeaway from tonight is be scientifically robust and collaborate. And on that note, I thank you all very much. And I would invite you now to go and have something to eat and drink. Thank you. Thank you.